This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. Consolation might be the last word one would ordinarily associate with the book of Revelation. And yet, it is exactly what the Holy Spirit intends to give us through the last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation was given to the church at a time of great persecution. That is, towards the end of the first century, when Roman emperors had declared themselves divine and all the subjects of the Roman Empire had the, had the choice between either worshipping the emperor's image or being put to death. It was clear to the Christians that emperor worship was idol worship and would constitute a direct breach of the first commandment. Many of the early Christians preferred death to apostasy and shed their blood in faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Yet, the whole situation of death and suffering was very confusing, confusing to the Christians. Why, one can imagine them asking, and we are still asking the same question today, why is it that the evil one still has so much power over the world if, as we confess, Jesus has overcome sin, death, and Satan through his own death and resurrection? The monstrosity of evil that perdures in world history constitutes an enormous temptation for the faithful of every generation to doubt that God is really all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving. Why does he permit so much evil and suffering? In response, God has given us the precious book of Revelation. It constitutes an antidote to the temptation to confusion and doubt. Its symbolic language makes it very clear that the situation of those suffering Christians under the hostile Roman Empire typifies the situation of all Christians of all times. So the Holy Spirit uses the situation of the first century Christians to give us a picture of the situation in which every Christian of every time finds himself in. As the title of the book, Revelation, illustrates very nicely, in this book, Jesus takes away the veil that covers the mystery of history and allows us to see it from a heavenly perspective, from the perspective of his and our final victory. It is a revelation that God the Father has given to Jesus to be revealed to his church through his prophet, John. Revelation 1.1. From a heavenly perspective... It gives us a synopsis of the battle between good and evil from before the foundation of the world, that is, since the fall of the angels, until the second coming of Christ and the final consummation of the world. Now, unlike the case in a novel where the reader is held in suspense as to who the winner will be, the book of Revelation makes it very clear from the outset who the winner is. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and those who belong to him. Through this book, Jesus himself speaks to us the same words addressed to the prophet and visionary John. He commands us, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the key to death and Hades. Revelation 1.18 if Jesus has the key to death and Hades, then it follows logically that death and Hades have no more power. And yet we live in a world which still seems to be under the almost total control of the evil one. Death is powerfully at work, both through the enemies of the church, be they religious fanatics or political leaders, as well as through natural powers like the pandemic we just lived through, or what we see currently happening in Russia, right? Who could deny the power of evil when you look at what's going on between Russia and the Ukraine? Wherever we look, we see the footprints of death and Hades. And that is exactly why God has given us the consolation of this book's revelation. 
in the face of persecution, war, famines, natural catastrophes, and plagues, Jesus wants us to know that although it might look as if the powers of evil were stronger than God, in reality, they have already been brought to naught. Whatever havoc they are still creating on earth, nothing, absolutely nothing, is happening without God's permission. Contrary to what it looks like from our earthly perspective, God is not indifferent to the fate of his creation, abandoning it to let things take their own course. Rather, he, God, is the primary actor of history, acting with humanity, and if need be against it, to bring creation to its final destination. God wants us to know and understand that everything that is happening un is under his control and that all the evil which he permits us to suffer has a purpose, is part of a divine plan and will contribute to the bringing about of a new creation in which, quote, death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain, as Revelation 21 verse 4 so beautifully says. God wants us to be assured of the final victory so that, comforted and encouraged by our sharing in God's heavenly perspective, we will not be afraid to participate in the battle in which we, each and every one of us, play a vital role and so that we will not shrink from what we have yet to suffer. It says in Revelation 2.10, do not be afraid of what you will yet have to suffer. This is illustrated in the following way. In chapter one, John describes the vision of the risen Lord who is standing in the midst of seven golden lamb stamps. And the risen Lord holds seven stars in his hands. Jesus then explains that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lamb stands are the seven churches themselves. The number seven, which is the scriptural number of perfection, signifies that the seven churches represent the church of all times and all places. Christ is standing in the midst of the lampstands. This signifies his presence in the midst of his church. He is holding her angels, that is their bishops, firmly in his hands. In other words, It's the risen Lord himself who is guiding the church and holding her securely. Even though some of the churches are in urgent need of conversion, as John's letter, letters to these churches make crystal clear, Christ gives them time to convert. We are still in the time of mercy. In chapter four then, John and the reader with him is taken up into heaven because the Lord wants us to know what must take place. Revelation 4.1. God wants us to view the unfolding of history from his divine perspective. And that is why the vision begins in the heavenly throne room. God's throne and the one who sits upon it are seen at the center, not only of heaven, but the entire cosmos symbolized by the four living creatures. Here, with God, is the fullness of power in heaven and on earth. So it's not the laws of nature nor blind fate, but the will of the one sitting on the throne that determines everything that will take place. The rainbow which arches over the throne of God serves to recall the sign of peace between God and humanity harkens back to Genesis 9, and is to remind us that God has a plan of salvation and hope for the world. Before the lamb that is standing before the throne will unfold the frightening history of the world before our eyes, the whole vision of the heavenly court reassures us that the almighty and merciful God definitively wants the world's salvation, even if 
the way to that salvation leads through catastrophes that, though caused by the wickedness of man, serve both the wicked and the good as chastisements for salvation. To the right of the Father's throne, a scroll is visible, written within and on the back, the famous scroll with its seven seals. It symbolizes the book which contains the entire course of world and church history as the salvation history of God. No one in heaven or on earth can break open its seals except for the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, because he has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so we see the Lamb going to the throne and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. This describes the Lamb of God's accession to the throne and the handing over of all power to him by the Almighty Father. So the Heavenly Father gives all the power over world history into the hands of his son, Jesus Christ, who is here symbolized as the Lamb of God. Everything that the book of Revelation will report from now on is written in this book <clears throat> and is both made known and realized by the one who proclaims it, Christ. No one, whether angel, man, or devil, has insight into God's secret plan for the world, much less has the capacity to bring it about, except the Son of God, who became man, was crucified like a sacrificial lamb for our sins, rose triumphantly from the dead, and ascended into heaven, where all the power in heaven and on earth was given to him. Matthew 28, 18. The fate of everyone in heaven, on earth and under the earth, thus lies firmly in the hands of Jesus until the end of the world, when he will subject, subject himself and all of creation back to the Father, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. This knowledge that all control lies in the hands of Jesus must give any Christian living in the time in between Christ's ascension into heaven and his second coming a supernatural trust in divine providence among the calamities of this present age. So then from chapter six onwards, we witness the unfolding of world history as the lamb opens one seal after the other. Upon the breaking open of the seventh and last seal, seven angels appear blowing seven trumpets and eventually seven angels holding seven bowls with the seven last plagues through which God's wrath is accomplished. Neither the seals, the trumpets, or the bowls follow an exact chronological order of events as if we could, could calculate the time of Christ's return by correlating current events of history with one of the scenes described in the book of Revelation. You sometimes find that in, in certain modern commentaries where people try to say, oh, okay, and the, the, the locust is now the invention of the motorcycle, and you know they try to accord the book of Revelation with current events. Of, uh, events in history. And that is not how the book works. It, we see in the synoptics the entire world rolled up in one scroll, but all of these plagues and visions we see correspond to, to all the different times in the time of the church. The church has clearly dismissed this chronological mapping as a heresy called millena millenarianism. So rather than correlating the current events, these events revealed by the breaking open of the seals and their contents are to be read as happening contemporaneously throughout the history of the world. They thus give us a an understanding of the universal situation of the church up to the time of the last judgment. The time between the resurrection and the second coming of the Lord is marked, as Jesus has already warned us in the gospel, Matthew 24, by wars between nations, civil wars, economic crisis, death through sword, famine, plagues, and the beasts of the earth, 
and fierce persecutions of Christians. There would also be natural calamities such as devastating hailstorms, lightning causing wildfires, meteorites and earthquakes, and even the elements of the cosmos will turn against man. We find all this in the book of Revelation. The first four seals form a group. Each time the lamb breaks open a seal, one of the four living creatures who symbolize the cosmos commands a horse and its rider to come and bring destruction over the earth in the form of war, civil war, famine, and plagues. The fact that it is the four living creatures who call these riders signifies that, although all of this happens with the permission of God, the calamities themselves do not come from God, but from the sphere of creation. By saying the horse's rider was permitted to take the peace away from the earth, which is technically called a divine passive, meaning that God is the subject who gives the power to take away peace. So by this divine passive, God's permissive will is expressed. That is to say that the powers of evil can do nothing on their own accord, but only what God allows them to do. In fact, it is our own human wickedness, political and economic greed for power, hatred, jealousy, depravity, and immorality that empower these forces of evil. The cosmic number four indicates that these disasters accompany the history of the church and of the world from the Lord's ascension into heaven until his second coming. During this period, which the Acts of the Apostles call the end times, these powers work destruction within history. Yet, even if the faithful have to suffer these calamities together with the entire world, they know that God is only allowing them because he intends these chastisements for man's salvation. So whatever evil God allows, yeah, the evil never has its source in God. It has the, its source in humanity's sin. But if when God allows a natural catastrophe, or, what, or be it a plague, he allows it because his final purpose is our conversion and our salvation. The Christian is to know that all of God's judgments are for the healing of the world. Then the fifth seal reveals the fate of the Christian martyrs, those who have been slaughtered because of the witness they bore for the word of God. They are underneath, they're seen underneath the altar in heaven, which is the heavenly counterpart to the altar of Holocaust in the temple of Jerusalem. That means their lives have become a sacrifice. In perfect imitation of Christ, they have offered their lives to the Father. That is why they are now in the heavenly sanctuary, just like the Lamb of God himself. They have been given white robes, and they ask the question which all of us have, Oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood? How much longer will you watch the slaughtering of your beloved sons and daughters? The answer is given. A little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The predestined number of martyrs must be completed. The calamities of the first five seals were restricted to human beings. Now, the vision of the sixth seal reveals disturbance of nature and the cosmos that will precede the final judgment. On the verge of its last day, the day which the book calls the day of the wrath of the Lamb, the earth begins to quake, the sun turns black, the, mu the moon becomes like blood, the stars fall from the sky like unripe figs. These are images that symbolize the end of the world. The cosmos seems to fall apart while the earth is thrown into such a chaos that it becomes almost unrecognizable. The dissolution of any order confronts humanity with the chaos of doom and gives it a presentiment of the world's destruction. In reaction to this dissolution of the cosmic order, godless men are thrown into panic. They try to flee, but there is nowhere to hide from their guilty conscience 
and from the Lamb who has appeared for judgment. The day of the Lamb's wrath will reveal that the Savior of the world is also its judge. Faced with the wrath of the Lamb, the godless ask, who can withstand it? The answer is given immediately in another vision. The terror and despair of the wicked are contrasted with the preservation of the servants of God. During the great tribulations, they will experience God's special protection and will be guided through the turmoil of this life towards their final goal, which is the throne of God. This is shown in two images. One is an image of the church militant in the midst of earthly chaos, and the other shows the church triumphant, those who have already reached God's peace in eternity. Four angels are holding back four winds of destruction that will complete the devastation of the world. Before these angels are allowed to do so, however, the servants of God are marked with a seal on their forehead. This seal is a symbol of baptism, which marks the elect as God's own property. The seal is not a pledge of preservation from the mighty winds that will damage the land and the sea. Rather, it is the promise that the faithful will be preserved in these storms and saved through them. Their number is the famous symbolic number of 144,000, which is a symbolic number for the uncountable multitude of people who have already been and will still be saved. This vision is a preview of what can be seen only at the end. The multitude of those who have been saved, who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, are standing before the throne of God and of the Lamb. These, we learn, shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. This heavenly vision of those who are already saved serves as a massive encouragement for those who, like the visionary John and ourselves, remain on earth faced with the persecution for the sake of their faith and suffering the cosmic consequences of humanity's rebellion against God. God is telling us, do not fear, fight courageously. If you persevere, you will be saved and I, your God, will let you drink from the fountain of eternal life and will wipe away every tear of yours and you will not even remember them. One would now expect that the seventh seal heralds the end of God's plan of salvation. Instead, another seven plagues unfold. We are shown seven visions of seven angels blowing seven trumpets in chapters 9 to 11. This is followed by another seven angels holding seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God the last seven plagues. As I said, we must not view them as taking place chronologically after the day of God's wrath. Rather, the book goes back and forth between two things. On the one hand, visions of the end, which are meant to encourage us and give us perseverance in view of our heavenly reward. And on the other hand, the description of the plagues, which man's obstinate unwillingness to repent calls down on humanity. Thus, even when these plagues have already turned the earth into an almost uninhabitable environment, people still blaspheme the name of God who had power over these plagues, but they did not repent or give him glory. Revelation 16, 9. We, earthly beings, try to give calamities like the coronavirus or droughts, famine, wildfires, climate change, etc., a scientific explanation. And that is partially true. But God makes it crystal clear that the real root of all these natural catastrophes lies on a deeper level in our own sinfulness, which causes the powers of nature themselves to turn against man, to use an expression of Saint Hildegard of Bingen, who is a doctor of the church. Not only does nature turn against man, converting this world from paradise to hell, 
But the wickedness of man also gives demonic powers an increasing influence over the world. Thus, the fifth trumpet describes how a fallen angel is allowed to open the shaft of the bottomless pit and demons in the form of locusts with the symbolic power of scorpions are let loose to torment all those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. In other words, those who are not baptized. In the sixth trumpet, similar forces of evil, at the sixth trumpet, similar forces of evil are let loose millions of cavalry troops looking like monsters who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Revelation 9, 15. With regard to this demonic chastisement, it is important to see that while the baptized were not spared the natural catastrophes, but saved through them, they are, so the baptized are preserved from the power of the demons. These have no permission to cause the baptized any harm. This is a very important testimony to the power of the sacraments. The sacraments or our faith does not take us out from the world and thus we suffer what the world has to suffer. But if we do not break our baptismal seal by mortal sin, we are indeed preserved from the evil one just as Jesus had prayed in John 17, 15. The same applies to the church as a whole, as the frightening prophecy of the sixth trumpet now makes clear. The prophet is sent to measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. That is an image for the church. But he is to exclude the outer court of the temple. He is not to measure it, for the outer court of the temple has been handed over to the Gentiles who will trample the holy city for 42 months. This is the beginning of chapter 11. 42 months, are three and a half years, the same time as the beast of the Antichrist is given authority over the inhabitants of the world, as described in chapter 13. Three and a half is half of seven which is the num symbolic number of perfection. So three and a half stands for a limited, imperfect time. It is the limited time allotted by God to the power of the evil one. During this time, the evil one is even allowed to trample the outer court of the temple. Now this symbolizes the extremely delicate situation of the church in the world. Only her innermost sanctuary is spared, which is to say the essence of the church in her faith and in her cult. The fact that the outer court is not protected shows that only a remnant of those who persevere in faith and adoration of God will endure the demonic attacks on the church. The fact that the entire holy city is given over to the Gentiles means that the church will entirely lose her cultural profane position in the world. And I think we can see this very, we're on the verge of seeing this at the moment where, you know, if you think back a couple of hundred centuries, um, the church, particularly in Europe, was the one that dominated everything and guided everything. And in every country, I'm from Germany, uh, when I was a child, the bishops still had a, were highly respected people in the public area. This is long gone. The church is really reduced to her core um, competence, let's say, the cult and the proclamation of her faith. And she has become a small, small remnant in, in the midst of a world that is very hostile to her. The fact that the outer court is not protected shows that only a remnant of those who persevere in faith and adoration of God will endure the demonic attacks even the church is not exempt from. And the fact that the entire holy city is going given over to the Gentiles means that the church will entirely lose her cultural profane position in the world. But the consolation is that in spite of both interior and exterior afflictions, during the apocalyptic time, and we see the interior afflictions of the church also very prominently at the moment, in spite of all this, the church will indeed be preserved 
in her innermost being, and that is what's most important, her faith and her, her, um, her adoration. The vision is a warning against all who attempted to compromise with the spirit of the world, or let's call it the zeitgeist, in order to make the church more culturally relevant. Those who are thus tempted to leave the innermost sanctuary, that is the faith and the cult of the church, will not be able to resist the destructive powers of hell. However, the enigmatic vision of the two witnesses who would then die and rise on the third day, which might be an image of the royal and prophetic priesthood of the church, pointing to her almost extinction, does end with the conversion of many who were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Thus, not everyone who's currently outside of the church's sanctuary will be eternally lost. So that is very clear. The, the evil one gets so much power even over the church and everything seems to be lost. And then suddenly everything changes. And when these two witnesses die and come back, then many people come to the faith. And so you see how God, again, uses uh, what he allows the evil one to do will eventually bring about the faith of many with the, and therefore their salvation. With the blowing of the seventh trumpet, we are then once again shown a heavenly vision of the victorious end to console us and give us a bit of a break. A voice in heaven acclaims that the kingdom of the world now belongs to our God and to his Christ, who will reign forever and ever. However, instead of the judgment which is announced, we are permitted a glimpse into the heavenly temple where the Ark of the Covenant appears, which then transforms into a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. Revelation 12, the famous vision. And now finally, both the origin of evil and suffering and the reason for God's ongoing permission of all this is revealed. We see the woman in labor pains giving birth to the Messiah. The woman symbolizes the old covenant people, that is Israel, symbolized in the figure of Rachel, the church, and by extension, Mary. Then a dragon appears in the sky, who is identified as being the ancient serpent from Genesis 3.15, the one who tempted Eve. He's identified as the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. Revelation 12, 9. I continue to quote, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with an iron rod, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. End quote. This is a terse description of the century, center of history. The incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, his birth, his death, and his ascension into heaven, whence he now reigns the nations with an iron rod. Thereupon, the vision goes even further back in time, or rather, I should say, outside of time, and relates the fall of Satan and his angels, who, wanting to be like God, Ka'el, lost his position in heaven and was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. There he deceived the whole world, beginning with our first parents and not resting until this very day. The entire mystery of the church and her life is encapsulated in this chapter. The vision of these two signs in the sky, the woman with the child and the dragon, harkens back to what we call the proto-gospel, the proto-evangelion, in Genesis 3.15. After the fall of our first parents, God had cursed the serpent, saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There in Genesis 3.15, God had already made a promise that just as a woman was first to be deceived by Satan, so also it would be a woman who would give birth to the one who would overcome the devil. When the devil realized that he could no longer harm Jesus, he turned to persecute the woman that is the church. However, the church, like the people of Israel under Pharaoh, is taken up by eagles' wings and carried into the desert, 
where she's taken care of for a period of 1260 days or three and a half years, which is the same time span. Then, Revelation says, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. End quote. One is reminded of Christ's promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Matthew 16, 18. Seeing that the devil could do nothing against the church in her holy essence, the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 12, 17. This scene is key to understanding why we constantly find ourselves in conflict with the evil one and his machinations. God could have overcome the devil all by himself, obviously, and he did. However, just as it was man who handed this world over to Satan and his armies, so also God wanted man to resubmit creation to him. And just as the first Adam was given a woman at his side as head over the old creation, so also the new Adam, Jesus Christ, wanted to bring about his rule over the new creation together with his bride, the new Eve. Yes, Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed over death and Satan, but he wants to share this victory with us who by grace of our baptism belong to his bride, the church. This means, however, that each and every one of us will need to pass through the same temptations as Jesus and will ultimately have to choose whether to bend his knees before Satan and his agents or before God alone, a decision which may very likely cost us our earthly lives, but will make us partakers in the tree of life in the world to come. The reality of this terrible choice is powerfully envisioned in chapter 13, which describes Satan's reign on earth by means of different political powers. The description of the Roman Empire and its demand to worship the emperor serves here again as a typological symbol for any absolute and tyrannical political system that arrogates divine rights to itself. Throughout the history of the church, her children will find themselves living in political systems that will either persecute them outright, as is happening in communist regimes in some Islamic countries, or force them to act against their Christian conscience, as we see happening in many secular Western states at the present day. Metaphorically speaking, no one can buy or sell in these countries unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Reading these pages of Holy Scripture, one might be shocked to see how much authority and power God has granted the evil one. Not only is the dragon allowed to make war on the holy ones and conquer them, he's even granted permission to damage the church. As the book explains in, in chapter 13, verse 10, it is here that the faith and the endurance of the holy ones are made manifest. Meanwhile, the inhabitants of the earth, and that's how the, how the book of Revelation calls those who are hostile to God. Meanwhile, the inhabitants of the earth, whose names were not written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, are fascinated by the beast and worship the dragon because it gave its authority to the beast. This is, of course, this of course implies their sinful passions. Now, the book says the work of their hands, to give worship to demons and idols made from gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Their murders, their magic potions, their unchastity, and their robberies. You can easily translate this list into our modern sins. They are, again, contrasted with the behavior of those ransomed, those who have the name of the Lamb and His Father written on their forehead, those who have not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes and in their mouth no lie was found for they are unblemished. Now, 
The term virginity here probably refers to those who did not commit spiritual adultery by worshiping idols. Now, this is the background against which we have to read the breaking open of the seven seals, the trumpets and the plagues that now follow in chapters 15 and 16. Just as the Old Testament, just as in the Old Testament, God mercifully allows humanity to reap the fruits of its own sinfulness. As the last resort of a father's love, he allows the above described calamities and plagues to befall his creation in the hope of bringing it to conversion. Again, the calamities of history do not have their source in God, but he uses them as his merciful judgments, which come from the depth of a father's heart in order to bring those back to him who would otherwise be eternally lost. Of course, as fellow citizens in this world, God's servants are also struck by these chastisements. But because of their innocence, their sufferings are joined to the sufferings of Christ and thus contribute as an atoning offering to the salvation of the world. As is made clear in the heavenly visions of Revelation chapter 6 and 8, their suffering, the suffering of the innocent, rise like incense on the gold altar that is before the throne of God and hasten the consummation of history towards the final coming of Christ when all things will be made new. Yes, by the blood of the Lamb, which is shed in the death of a martyr, and the word of their testimony, Christians are actively conquering Satan. This means that if we are faithful to the grace received in our baptism and persevere in the observance of his commandments, not compromising with the spirit of the world and the apparent advantages the agents of the beasts have to offer, none of our sufferings will be in vain or lost. Rather, every innocent pain that we suffer in union with Christ will hasten the coming of God's kingdom, will bring salvation to the world and will contribute to the conquering of the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. It is our own blood mingled with the blood of the lamb and the faithful word of our testimony that will bring about the final defeat of humanity's arch enemy. Three and a half years is the limited time span God has allotted to Satan to seduce humanity. A time of grace during which God does not cease to call his children to conversion. And we are well advised to be aware of that. The time of mercy will also come to an end. Though we have to refrain from reading these catastrophic events in the chronological order, Revelation does make it clear that they intensify with the coming closer of Christ. While this time that is allotted to the evil one might seem exceedingly long to us, Satan knows, so the book says, that he has but a short time, Revelation 12, 9. Indeed, as we saw, we already know the outcome of the battle. Yes, it is not for us to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, as Acts 1, 7 says, but we are to know with absolute certainty that the victory is already won and that the demise of Satan's earthly reign, symbolized by the whore of Babylon in chapter 17, is already decreed. The day will come when the devil and his retinue will be thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But to the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him, I, Jesus, will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron, even as I, Jesus myself, have received authority from my Father. Jesus promises that if we follow his example on this earth by humbling ourselves and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, he will make us partakers in his kingdom 
sharing even his own throne with us. Yes, as Our Lady said to St. Bernadette of Lourdes, we are not assured of happiness or victory in this life, but certainly in the next. If we conquer Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, suffering silently and united to Jesus, we will be clothed in white garments and our names will never be blotted out of the book of life. Revelation 3, 5. We shall be granted to eat the tree of life, receive the crown of life, and call to participate in the unending wedding feast of the Lamb and his bride. This knowledge of victory and salvation is the consolation that God is offering us through the book of Revelation. <laughs> And thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, you talked a lot about um, the chastisements um, and how it's for the wicked and for the just. Um, and the same exact chastisements, uh, it's global, it's not, um, not only individual. So I guess it makes sense to me for there to be chastisement for the wicked, but um, I guess in what sense does uh, that makes sense to chastise the just with the yeah. same exact and same way. You're right. So for the just, it's obviously not a chastisement because uh, you know you you send a chastisement to a to a son that yeah, is yeah. exactly to correct. Um, but uh, this is, I think, this is where our and it's something that we don't speak. So that is has maybe been a bit. Um, Sometimes <laughs> my, my English is not on the top of my head at the, this time of the day. It's it's we've a little bit lost the consciousness of this in the last fifty years. I would say that by virtue of our baptism, because Christ lives in us, we participate in in His mystery of atoning for the sins of the world. So we do become co-atoners, to uh, which means while it's our sins that call these chastisements of the world. Those who are absolutely innocent in these catastrophes, of course, let's uh, take something like the coronavirus. I can't, you know, I, I, I won't be spared the virus just because I'm baptized. I might, I get it just as well. But if I die from it, because I'm one with Christ crucified through my baptism, this becomes a, a blood of the martyrs that contributes to the washing of our brothers and sisters whom we are called to redeem, right? Because we want them to be saved as well. So we actually share in their salvation. That is why, you know, sometimes you might even wonder why natural catastrophes often, you think like, why does it hit the innocent? Yeah, we are sinning here without end and nothing is happening. <laughs> and then a tsunami hits in India where people don't seem to be so crazy as we are. <laughs> And the beauty is that the death of the innocent has the power of saving the wicked, which is supremely exemplified in Christ's own death on the cross and prefigured also in the suffering of people like Jeremiah in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, or all these um, type of, or, or take Mary underneath the cross, right? Who has ever, ever suffered as much as she has and she's the most innocent of creatures after Jesus. And yet she participates in the suffering of her son and thereby becomes the mother of all of humanity. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you talked about how that, like, right now we're in the age of mercy. Uh -huh. like, and then you're saying, don't take the events in relation to be chronological. So, like, where do you see this age of mercy fitting in with? The dramas that are happening. <laughs> well, basically, the age of mercy is since is from the time between Christ's ascension into heaven and his second coming. I mean, in in as long as we live, this is in the historical time of the church, but also in our personal lives. As long as I breathe, God is extending my mercy to me for me and hoping that I would turn back to him. But there is a moment where we, we have to take a final decision. And when Christ returns in glory... Well, then we have to have made up our minds. <laughs> or if he comes to fetch me personally, then I've better made up my mind. But this, what, we, what is so hard for us to see, but maybe you can relate to it a little bit, is that even these natural catastrophes, 
are seen from the, at least in the view of the book of Revelation, of Revelation, as an act of God's mercy trying to call us back to him. You know, because suffering from a virus is nothing to compare to eternal death. Um, in the back row. Yeah, I've always uh, been a little confused with catechism and okay, you get baptized, you're a good person, and then when you die, there's two options. You can go to hell or you can go to heaven. Okay, so that, that's one story. But then the other story is in the Apostle Creed. On the third day, he went to hell mm -hmm. and freed all the people. So it's kind of like before Christ's resurrection, everybody went to hell. Mm -hmm. And then he went down there to save them. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little confusing. That you know. And then now, what you're saying is that, oh, wait a minute, here's Revelation. <laughs> we have to wait until all this stuff happens, then we go to heaven or we go to hell. Ah, okay. Ver kind of now, very, very important and good question, because you hit, you hit right into a deep theological question. So um, I'm glad you asked a question because it allows me to clear up things. When we say in the creed, he went, he went ad inferos, we make a distinction between um, what the Old Testament calls the Sheol, which is kind of the, the land where before the incarnation and Christ's death on the cross, the question is, where were all the righteous people of the Old Testament? Because before Christ goes to the Father, heaven is closed, right? So they all have to be sleeping in some place and waiting for the Savior to come. And, when we, and so there is a huge the theological discussion. Did Jesus just go down into the land of the dead, the Sheol, and save those? Or did he actually go into the devil's headquarter, into hell, and free people from there? And the discussion is not closed. There is peop there's people arguing, actually, who say that Jesus actually went down into hell but the more theologically convincing thought is, well, if God is in hell, then hell is no longer hell, right? So hell only starts existing at the moment where God sends a savior, and then people can decide against or for their savior. So, so the, the, your confusion stems from the fact that we use the word hell in a double sense in English. We, we normally use it for eternal damnation, but in the creed, it's probably used for the place where all the dead were sleeping until Christ came, but it was not yet the place of eternal damnation. Um, in other language, you have two terms for that, languages. But so what I am saying now is my eternal destiny is decided the moment I die, not when Christ returns. Um, we all, it's in the moment of our death, is the, the last moment for our decision for or against Christ's salva salvation. And then, um, so this is interesting. Hopefully we all say, yes, Jesus, be my savior. <laughs> I, I, uh, I want to belong to you, save me. I repent of my sins. Then we're saved. And if we're super lucky, we don't have to go to purgatory because we've already done all the atonement down here. If we go to purgatory, it's still good news because it means we're saved. Then we stay in purgatory until we are purified from all the remains of our sins. And then our soul goes to heaven. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is that our bodies will not yet be resurrected. So we will already be safe. We'll be perfectly happy in, in, he in heaven. And yet there is a final resurrection outstanding and that will be the final judgment. So then when Christ returns, that's the moment we all get our resurrected bodies back. And then in that final judgment, we will actually see all the consequences of the evil things we did, but also all the beautiful, good consequences of the good things we did. But the good news is if you die and you go to purgatory, then you know you're safe. Then it's not like, okay, I still have to be afraid of the last judgment and then suddenly I end up in hell. No, um, it's only that at the last judgment, the entire world history, you know, in a way, God will, um, God will undergo his own judgment in the way that he will, we will suddenly understand and see with our eyes why he permitted all this and what was his reasoning in, in everything. Yeah, he, he will give a perfect account of, 
of in the entire history of humanity and our sufferings and the sufferings of others. That's going to occur in the second coming or? The second coming, yeah. Yeah. So, we're, so even though we go to heaven, mm -hmm. we have, there's this gap. Yep. We don't really have all the knowledge. No, exactly. And we don't yet have our bodies. But only Mary, she's the only one who has her body. And it's interesting because, you know, that time between you dying in the final judgment and God willing, you go straight to heaven. Then you participate in the communion of saints and you will be active here on earth, just like the saints whom we call upon. Right. I mean, we only call on St. Therese and, and the famous ones who have the statutes. But the other saints are not sitting in heaven playing check. I mean, they are active here and um, and also in, you know, all our ancestors who died. They're interceding for us. They, are, they might be standing by us, helping us do things. Um, you will have your own very, very personal, eternal vocation and role that, uh, that participates in the salvation of people on earth. Yeah, on that last point, you know, obviously you talk about a vocation. So what can we do as warriors of God? Let's say we recognize the evil, mm -hmm. disguised for us in different ways. You know, and what role can we play? Because people say you do your deeds and your work, you can actually co create what happens. Mm -hmm. Or how do we save human lives? Yeah. We alert people. And you're already doing it, that's your vocation. So, what are we supposed to do? I think the primary vocation for a Christian is very clear. Um, the first thing that Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. So to be always aware that um, I often fall in this trap. I say, oh, 20 years ago, I had my conversion. No, conversion is an ongoing process that I have to live on a daily basis um, to really, you know, I mean, it's very much on my mind nowadays with with Russia and Ukraine, and my question is like, what can I do? Well, the most important thing that I can do is go closer and closer to Jesus and allow Jesus to absolutely cleanse my heart from anything that is an obstacle to charity, right? So the easiest way to do that is, uh, number one, find a way of going, having the grace of going to frequent confession, because that is extremely powerful and cleanses our hearts. Then, make sure that I can receive the Eucharist as often as possible. Because if I go to daily communion, I receive Jesus daily in here and he more and more unites me with him, cleanses my heart and makes me stronger, right? And so the more I'm united with Christ, the more God can let his graces flow through me into the un universe. And we Christian, we baptize people often make the mistake to think, hey, it's the priest and the religious, right? <laughs> they do the job. And we forget that the salvation of the world hinges on us Christians being saints who are united with Christ and who allow God's power to flow through us. So this union with the Trinity through Jesus to be anchored in the Father is super important. Then, no, we are in Lent. Don't underestimate the power of fasting. Every fasting is an act of atonement. That is an atonement for my own sins, but also the sins of others in the world, right? All our sacrifices are an atoning offering for the evil that others are doing. And the beauty is our little acts of charity are so much more powerful than what the evil one does. So the devil is always telling us, oh, who are you? You little thing, are you nothing, right? And that is his biggest trick because look at Mary. What did she do? She wasn't in Nazareth. She was cooking for Jesus. She never said a word and was maybe knitting pullovers for him. And yet... Uh, she is the most saintly woman that ever lived. She was paradise restored to the point of, of becoming the co-redemptrix, as we call her, right? Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's these, very simple, these very simple means of um, making sure I live charity, I stay, like Jesus says, remain in my love. And as Catholics, we're so blessed because we have the sacraments. And then read the word of God, <laughs> which illumines our minds and, and uh, examines our conscience and helps us grow in union with Christ, living according to the mind of Christ. 
being one with Christ. Then, and then, so I'll tell you a beautiful <laughs> um, one. There's a, one of my favorite saints. She's called Saint Miriam of Abilene. Um, Saint Miriam of Jesus Crucified is her name. As a, anybody know her? You seem to know her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, she was a mystic from a very early age, but at one point, a Muslim slit her throat. <laughs> And she, it was, uh, he, he wanted to marry her and she said, no, I'm promised to Jesus. And then the, he got angry and slit her throat and put her in a dung in a, in a, in a wood. And um, the, the person who tried to kill her thought she was dead, but she woke up in a grotto in a forest in Israel. And um, there was this beautiful woman who took care of her for three weeks and never said a word. And at the end of the three weeks, the woman gave her a delicious soup to eat. And Miriam says later on, this was the most delicious thing I ever had in my entire life. And so after one spoon, she said to the lady, could I please have another spoon? <laughs> and the lady said, no, um, you will after this life, but for now you have to learn two important, uh, two important lessons and you will become a saint. And she says to her, receive... Oh, always be happy, always be happy with whatever you're given. Never ask for more. And secondly, receive whatever happens to you as coming directly from the hands of God. She lived by these two rules and became one of the greatest saints the church has ever seen. Little Miriam of... of uh, and so what's hidden in this, you know, um, re receive everything as coming directly from the hands of God. When I am rooted in Jesus... I can be 100% certain that whatever happens comes straight from the hands of the Father. And so if it's a suffering or something, a, a cross that I really didn't want, <laughs> um, because of your question, what can I do to help peace bring about? Well, then we need to be conscious that if a cross happens or, you know, it, it can just be something little annoying. Um, God allows these little things, uh, as St. Gertrude of Helfter says, as the wood that keeps the fire of charity alive, but also as my little part taking in the cross that's going to redeem the world. But it strikes me as you proclaim the word of God, Dr. Freeman, by describing, as we were discussing the chastisements that God will permit humanity to suffer. Um, it strikes me in relation to most of your other research work with the Song of Songs, that this is really an expression of intimacy with God um, and with Jesus as bridegroom, as you're describing um, the permissiveness that God, uh, through, through God's permissive will, that we are allowed mysteriously to participate in the sufferings of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is actually an encounter, like an intimate encounter with the bridegroom of our souls. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to that more, if that's something that... Well, I mean, well. you just nailed it. I mean, it's a mystery that um, if you look at the history of the saints, it strikes one that the greater the mystic, the closer to Christ, the greater the suffering. And it's so difficult, right? Because from our, our earthly eyes, we all shrink back from suffering. Obviously, we do. We, we have naturally afraid of suffering. And so I think, and it's also important not to be, not to, so when I grew up, I was always afraid of Jesus because I thought anyone who comes too close to Jesus ends up suffering and I don't want to suffering, so I better stay away, right? So um, it's important also to keep in mind what God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, something like 31, um, that God never allows more than we can bear. Um, uh, he, he will never allow, yeah, he, he, for whatever he calls us to do, we also get the grace. And um, I think, or Jesus often says to the mystics that it takes a very advanced stage of faith to understand that the gift of participating in his suffering is a gift from the depth of his spousal heart. So again, we see it in Mary, 
who was both his mother and his spouse and daughter of the father, um, because her calling was so high, she was, how, how to say, um, I'm, I'm stammering because I don't want to, I, I don't want to cause any fears. Um, and yet it is true that it is on the cross that the wedding of the lamb is consummated. And so the bride who participates in the consummation is underneath the cross. So if I want to look at it in a, in a let, let's take a different approach. Um, so, so we have to be careful not to be afraid that if I come too close to God, then these huge crosses will start happening. <laughs> uh, in the extent that God allows suffering, he also allows tremendous spiritual consolations. And if you look at the history of the, of the saints, the consolations that come with the suffering are always far greater than the suffering. If the suffering is lived with Christ and accepted from the hand of God, of course, if I rebel against the suffering, then it hurts. But if I get the grace to embrace it, then the consolation, th there's this paradox of the cross, which, um, which all the saints attest to, which even St. Thomas speaks about, that while Jesus being crucified on the cross was he had the most excruciating both physical and psychological pains, also experienced this supernatural joy because he knew that he was redeeming humanity, right? So there's always this paradox, like the martyrs who, who were rejoicing while they're being martyred because they, but the Holy, because the Holy Spirit is unleashed in you and the effects of the Holy Spirit is peace, joy, um, love, etc. Now, I think another important aspect is without looking for any crosses, we all and each and every one of us already have our crosses. And we have all been wounded in our life from since we were babies. Yeah, many of us even in our mother's womb. And we are carrying these wounds with us. And very often we're not taught to discover these wounds that we already have as the place of encounter with Jesus crucified. Because actually, it's in our very wounds that we are most uniquely un united to Christ because no one else shares our wounds. But it's those wounds that he took with him on the cross. And it's in those wounds, it's my wounds that he experiences on the cross and therefore the intimacy with him is deepest when I enter into my wounds, accept them and realize that they are the door to my union with Christ. And it, to the extent that I give my already existing wounds to Christ and allow him to purify them in his precious blood through the work of forgiveness for those who have inflicted these wounds on me. I mean, today is the gospel of forgiveness, right? To the extent that I learn with Jesus on the cross to say, Father, forgive them for they did not, they do not know what they're doing. They did not know what they're doing. In the name of Jesus, I forgive those who've hurt me. Um, my wounds become again channels of grace through which they become the wounds of Christ and therefore they become the channels of grace for the world. Like Jesus is the wounded healer, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you touch on an extremely important <laughs> uh, topic. Suffering is at the end of the day a spousal mystery. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Let's give it up for Dr. Once more. <laughs> <laughs>